hello and welcome to Women of the Middle East podcast. This podcast relates the realities of Arab women and their rich and diverse experiences. It aims to present the multiplicity of women's voices, and it wishes to break cultural stereotypes about women of the Middle East, as well as educate and empower the younger generation of Middle Eastern women who were stripped of their historical reference and weren't necessarily raised to believe in their agency and power to create their own destiny. I'm Amal Malki, I'm a feminist, scholar, and educator. I'm also the author of Arab Women in Arab News, Old Stereotypes and New Media. I created this podcast to be an extension and an update of the book and its main topics. Hello and welcome to episode 9. Episode 9 uh, was a very tough one to record um, and conceive because... I started with an intention to continue the series of women in conflict zones and I wanted to focus on Palestinian women. However, uh, the mother of all conflicts is the Palestinian one. Um, although, you know, words like conflict, battle or struggle aren't, I believe, the, the right words to describe the reality and intensity and severity of um, uh, the occupation of Palestine. Palestine is a nation under occupation, is a colonized nation, and the Palestinian people have been under um, colonialism uh, since 48. When I looked at um, what I wanted to include in the episode uh, in terms of historical background and such, I was worried really of, of missing things out. The history from the angle of women's struggle depicting women's history uh, gives us a more comprehensive and realistic version um, that usually is not uh, accounted for or usually is not depicted when speaking about histories of nations under uh, threat or under occupation. And this is why I wanted to speak about um, women's struggle right from the beginning. The Holy Land of Palestine Um, which is a sacred spot and a holy land to Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam, which is a symbol, a religious and a historical symbol, but also reality for those who are living uh, under occupation. A very tough and uh, sad and long history of imbalanced powers and power dynamic, which always disadvantage the Palestinians. Talking about the history of Palestine through women's lens, through women's organizations and feminists struggle in Palestine gives it another dimension. Palestine and its long and brutal history uh, of conflict uh, where freedom fighters uh, have been turned into terrorists in the Western popular mind. Uh, Nelson Mandela has said, We know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. It is the subject of scholarly uh, work, but we cannot speak about seminal work uh, without mentioning Edward Said, the books The Question of Palestine, that was published in 1979, and that was followed by Covering Islam, published in 1981. Uh, Edward Said focused on uncovering the misrepresentations of contemporary uh, politics in the Middle East by Western and especially American media. He uncovered uh, the biases and uh, stated the truths behind the Palestinian exile and disposition. What he did also was uh, he forwarded a Palestinian narrative to counter the Zionist or pro-Israeli narrative that's out there and that has been powerful, basically, in the West. And I would say Edward Said is one of the first, actually, scholars who managed to do such. And his work has been the foundation upon which other work have been um, based. Uh, Lots of uh, scholars have added to that narrative chapters and chapters of books. One of the latest books there is also one that um, I've re- read recently, and it's by a faculty member at my college. 
uh, titled Women's Political Activism in Palestine, a Peace Building and Resistance of Survival that was published in 2018. It adds another chapter in the Palestinian narrative by capturing the informal activism of women based on alternative memories and histories. The informal as well as formal women activism provide a picture, although I don't believe it's a complete one, because I believe that as much as we scholars, anthropologists, historians try to capture and document, uh, many goes untold and undocumented. But it gives a picture about the historical uh, sequence um, uh, evolution of activism, whether formal or informal, although this book focuses on the informal uh, acts of political activism. It's worth reading. I speak uh, in this episode to Randa Senora, who is the General Director of the Women's Center for Legal Aid and Counseling. She is a human rights and women's rights activist with a professional experience in the field of international human rights and humanitarian law for over 35 years. She was the first Palestinian woman uh, ever to brief the UN Se Security Council on Women, Peace and Security in 2018. In 2019, she was selected among the 100 most influential people in gender policy around the world. Randa has an LLM in International Human Rights Law from the University of Essex, UK, and an MA degree in Sociology and Anthropology from the American University in Cairo. Randa Senora gives a comprehensive background of her um, personal narrative. She speaks about her journey as a human rights defender through talking about her childhood, upbringing, education, and career. Her personal narrative is a part of the political and historical narrative of her country, Palestine. It was occupied when she was only six years old, and this historical turn has shaped who she is and what she stands for, like everyone else on that land. Background of the political uh, uh, is very um, prominent and very important in their lives. Palestine is a nation under occupation, a nation where women carry a double oppression as women and as Palestinians. It is therefore important for us as listeners to understand that personal narrative, and it's not just any personal narrative, it's a, it's a woman's story. Um, and this is exactly what makes it special. And add to that the fact that it is intertwined with the historical and political context that till this day determine who they are and how they live. This intersectionality links the socio-economic oppression of women with the national oppression and the gender oppression with the political oppression. I also inject some background information through the interview and these intervals are to widen the lens for a speaker who is keen on understanding the story from its beginning. I add information about women's movements in Palestine and the major divergences they witnessed. So shall we begin? Let's take this journey into Palestinian women's struggle. Brenda Senora, it's a pleasure to have you on Women of the Middle East uh, podcast. Um, thank you, Amal, and uh, uh, the pleasure is really mine to be with you today. Uh, I am Randa Senora. I am a Palestinian human rights, human rights defender and a feminist who has uh, devoted her whole life to human rights issues. From my childhood, it seems that I was uh, born uh, to be um, a human rights defender and a women's rights defender. I do recall from my uh, very young age, I was encouraged by my father. He was my model. Uh, he thought from the very beginning I should be a lawyer because I always defended my rights and uh, I never accepted like my siblings that he imposes anything on me. I always told him we can discuss and if you can convince me, then I, uh, I will take your point of view. If you don't convince me, then you have to accept my opinion. So from the very beginning, I, I set the, the rules to my father who couldn't impose anything on me. And often he would tell me, 
I, I don't know why I didn't accept your opinion before going into this in-depth discussions, because after all, you, you are beating me. I was encouraged from, by my father to speak out and be courageous. And I always bring in the story of my very, very conservative cousin of my father, who was like uh, always insisting that girls should have, shouldn't be equal to boys in the family. And uh, he was always irritated that uh, I wear my cho- shorts when I was in a younger age and I get out of the house uh, to, uh, to, to go for sports with my shorts. He was uh, an accountant who works on a, on a gas station just across our home. And therefore, just uh, to defy him, I would always take the bus from the second station in order to pass by his office and show him that every time he was visiting us, my father would go and tell me, go put on your shorts. We have a visitor today, a guest. (laughs) Definitely in a patriarchal society, despite the fact that my father was a a, a bit more open uh, as a father, he had his own thinking of the role of uh, where we stand as girls and where uh, boys are, uh, despite the very fact that he was a bit open about it. There are things that are allowed to my brother, but not necessarily allowed to us as as girls. Uh, We were four girls and one boy. To give us that background, I knew from the very beginning that I should be an advocate and a lawyer. And I turned out at the very end when I, I even wanted to continue my studies in law, but I didn't. I went through sociology and um, and uh, anthropology at the beginning. I got my first degree, second degree at university. But then I decided that I wanted to do uh, human rights. I started my first career in a mainstream human rights organization, very no- well known, Al Haq, Law in the Service of Man. Uh, and uh, man, in Arabic it says حقوق uh, insan yani, uh, human rights, but uh, in English it's the uh, law in the service of man, uh, meaning humanity and human beings, you know. Uh, I developed the career, the program on the women's rights. At uh, I was a legal researcher at the time, and I developed the program on women's rights uh, because at the time there were no women's human rights organizations per se professional specialized organizations and it was very important to mainstream human rights in the uh, women's rights in the work of human rights organizations i joined al haq in 87 and uh, and uh, there were no organization at the time only at late uh, 80s and early 90s women's professional organizations like human rights organizations uh, were established including uh, the organization that I'm now um, heading, uh, which is the Women's Center for Legal Aid and Counseling. Uh, it has been established in 91 uh, as a, a feminist uh, human rights uh, uh, women's organization to provide legal aid and services to women victims of gender-based violence and to influence policies and legislation. The services were intended in order to really change the uh, change the the existing policies and legislation which were discriminatory and were inherited from the previous uh, historical uh, uh, periods which in which Palestine has been, whether the British mandate over Palestine, even it goes some of the legislation and policies go back to the Ottoman period who ruled over uh, Palestine, historic Palestine uh, in the four, 400 years. And then we had the British mandate over Palestine, and then the Jordanian rule over the West Bank and East Jerusalem, uh, uh, as well as the Egyptian rule over uh, the Gaza Strip. So uh, during these uh, historic periods, uh, the the governing uh, body or the governments uh, either imposed their own laws on Palestine or developed uh, different le- uh, legislation that were uh, either based in Gaza on the Palestinian laws but also uh, on the uh, other uh, legislation. So there are different legal settings or mm. se- sets of laws that are still in force. This has been further uh, made more compound with the advent or with the Israeli military occupation in 1967 of the remaining part of historic Palestine, the West Bank and Gaza Strip, including also, of course, East Jerusalem, and imposing military orders that were amending or changing uh, current legislation 
and uh, therefore although an occupying power under international humanitarian law has no uh, uh, right to uh, amend legislation but it was uh, the israelis that imposed legislation to amend the existing laws under the pretext of the best interest of the local population for security considerations and mm -hmm. in both cases um, uh, uh, the, this has caused to a lot of major amendments to existing laws the and imposed on uh, uh, the Palestinians living in the 1967 occupied Palestinian territory, as you know, 1996, with the advent of the Palestinian Authority in the early uh, 90s. Uh, we had the first Palestinian elections. Before mm -hmm. that, uh, we had a military rule. The Israelis were imposing their military rule. The only elections that took place were for municip municipal elections in 1976. And uh, these municipal elections or local elections, which the Israelis conducted uh, prior to the advent of the Palestinian Authority, were uh, conducted in order to try to bring in Rawabit al-Qura, which are village leagues that were very much connected with the Israeli military occupation, and they wanted to uh, impose them on the local Palestinian population. And uh, they also heavily uh, depended on uh, on the votes of Palestinian women, whom, whom they thought would go and uh, vote for the traditional tribalistic uh, elements in the society. The surprise for us, for the Israelis, when Palestinian women, being part of the Palestinian national movement, has voted for the more uh, uh, progressive national uh, groups, and uh, the elections were a failure for the Israelis. They underestimated the, the role of Palestinian women. Therefore, the elections were lost by the village leagues who were cooperating mm. with the Israelis. And uh, that was the only democratic practice that we had under occupation, limited uh, under a hidden agenda. But uh, mm. the actual elections were after Oslo, and the advent of the Palestinian Authority, with the election of the Palestinian first uh, uh, Palestinian Legislative Council in 1996, and in that elections, it was the Palestinians <laughs> that started to uh, uh, to legislate and uh, uh, and develop their own legislation, to develop their own judicial system, and so on, with limitations because Oslo has is its own limitations. Under this uh, environment, my organization as a, a feminist a human rights organization and many other organizations are functioning. We are registered as an NGO organization under the Palestinian laws. New laws were adopted and it was from the very beginning of the advent of the Palestinian Authority that the feminist movement and my organization, WICLAC, the Women's Center for Legal Aid and Counseling, uh, took the lead. We made mm -hmm. the first initiative in the early 90s, I do recall it, it was the model parliament, women mm -hmm. and legislation. We surveyed all the existing previous legislation and we saw the discriminatory provisions in the law and we highlighted them. And then we started to develop strategies to lobby and uh, influence policies and legislation as early as the advent of the Palestinian Authority. We wanted to conduct legal reform. We wanted to overcome the previous uh, heritage of uh, contradicting legislation. And uh, we entered into the legal reform process with a lot of uh, advocacy work, mobilizing this, uh, the Palestinian public, especially Palestinian women in, at the grassroots level, working with other organizations and uh, human rights organizations that started to emerge in uh, 80s, early 90s. The Palestinian women's movement, as early as the uh, late 70s, developed these committees that work at the grassroots level with the local communities with the women at uh, different, most isolated areas and uh, develop a social agenda where we address the issues that are important for women and for uh, women's emancipation and the right to equal uh, gender rights and equal equality uh, before the law and in, in political life and so on.
I interfere here to give a summary of the organized women's uh, movements and their role as agents in the continuous conflict for liberation. Feminist movements took different means of activism and their activism focused on different areas depending on the political and historical contexts they were living in. The history of women's activism in Palestine can be traced back to the 1920s, where the roots of Palestinian feminisms were with anti-colonialist and anti-Zionist movements of the 1920s. The Palestinian Women's Union was formed in 1921, coinciding with growing resistance to Zionist penetration, and the union shared the same political aims as the male-dominated national movement. The um, Palestinian Women's Union took part in in demonstrations against the Balfour Declaration, and it was the second oldest Palestinian organization of any type. There were similarities between the early Palestinian women's movements and mo women's movements in other Islamic countries, namely the women's movements came on the platform of national liberation. Uh, the women who fought for women's issues were educated upper class women. And at that point, the Palestinian women's movement did not question traditional gender roles or demand gender equality. Instead, their interests lay in charitable and relief work among the needy. Uh, the second phase uh, was in 1936 to 1939. Uh, during the revolt against Jewish settlement, Palestinian women cared for the injured, took part in demonstrations, hid re rebels, and some also took an active part in the armed struggle. During the third phase, uh, which was 1947-1948, with the establishment of the State of Israel, women increasingly carried the double burden of family and nation, thus radically altering their social roles. The fourth phase, uh, which was in the 1950s and 1960s, um, which some define as the period that the first generation of activists uh, came about, um, we saw the growth of many Palestinian political movements in the 1950s and the war of the 1967 brought many political movements uh, to the front. Each of these groupings had women's groups. Just as all groupings are represented in the Palestinian National Council, the women's groups are themselves represented in an umbrella group, the Women's Union. The Women's Union also contains women unaffiliated to any women's groups. These four phases made up the first generation of women's organizations, feminist women organizations. Now, the second generation started in 1967 to around 82, where women's activism took a new turn after the 1967 Israeli occupation of East Jerusalem, West Bank and Gaza Strip. Women's rights and the primary role of caregiving took second place to the nationalist cause. The uh, charitable work of the first generation of Palestinian women activists was replaced by a more radical feminist stance. Now, the third generation of uh, female um, Palestinian feminists and uh, female and women organizations uh, that started in 19, around 1982 is the third generation that was impatient with the restraints uh, shown by previous generations. They, they redefined what was political and they came to the forefront by participating in, in politics. Uh, some examples are uh, Hanan al-Sharawi and Intisar al-Wazir. The new generation of the 1990s um, actually saw many changes in women's movements in Palestine as a result of the political climate uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, for example, the Intifada, the increased global networking, the cumulative struggles of Palestinian women. And this is where we left our speaker, Randa Senor. So let's go back to her. Maybe that all of that is a rhetoric, or, uh, but there has been attempts. These committees were very much engaged with the later movement of more professional organizations like my organization, WICLA, where we started to get into a more professional work. The professional work always was combined with uh, the work of, um, of uh, these committees, as well as the early 60s, you know, the, uh, within the, in the context of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, there was the uh, Palestinian General Union or the General Union of Palestinian Women, 
which reflected uh, or represented the Palestinian different political parties and popular movements. And Palestinian women were on the National Council. And the General Union was on the National Council of the Palestinian uh, of, of the, the of the PLO and its different institutions. Uh, so the model parliament was only the first initiative that was really attacked attacked heavily by mm. the uh, traditional elements, including the more political Islamic movements, who emerged also with the first Palestinian Intifada in eighty nine. Mm and started to uh, uh, really also stand against uh, the Palestinian women's movement. They uh, claimed that we bring in uh, Western ideas, that Islam has provided women with all the rights. Uh, what we're claiming is not justified and that Palestinian women are respected and, uh, and that uh, this is only uh, the organizations that are being funded by Western countries that are and the European Union that are bringing alien ideas to our own society and the attack against us started from the modern parliament and the first organization to be attacked was Wikla. You know the Palestinian society and the women's movement have been existing prior to the advent of the Palestinian Authority and uh, we have been a vibrant uh, civil society instituting the absence of a government during the years of occupation. And therefore, we are a vibrant uh, civil society that do not give in very easily. Every time we're being uh, constrained now by the Palestinian Authority, by attempts to control the work of civil society organizations, we stand very firm together as a movement because we believe in our rights and we believe in the, the role that civil society can play to complement the role of official institutions. And therefore, we don't give up on that. We want to continue with our work, with our oversight of the performance of the Palestinian Authority in all aspects of Palestinian life, including uh, gender equality and women's human rights. Uh, I just want to mention that when I was um, at WICLA, we had uh, uh, an initiative prior to the advent of the Palestinian Authority that, as fo that is focused on gender equality. We, we, we initiated a project uh, at the time, which is women, law and uh, development. Uh, we took the example of the Asian women and the African women who, who wanted to work on uh, women, law and development and wanted to really uh, uh, ensure gender equality through uh, legal reform. And at the time, we developed uh, work in the Palestinian society. It's very similar to the model parliament, but was done under the women uh, law and, and development experience. And in it, we worked with working groups uh, and uh, we formulated uh, committees in the most remote areas. And we started to open the debate even prior to the advent of the Palestinian Authority. We were sure that we don't have uh, laws that protect women victims of violence. We are not happy with the penal laws that, that do not address sexual violence, domestic violence within the family and all of that. And mm -hmm. we wanted to make reform in the uh, family uh, personal status laws that impact the daily lives of Palestinian women. That was Al-Haq's initiative. But because it was prior to the advent of the Palestinian Authority and prior to the formulation of some of the political Islamic movements, we were attacked mildly, but the real attack was when the Palestinian Authority was there because they wanted to use women as, uh, as uh, only a tool for mm. political uh, uh, empowerment of the newly established political parties, namely Hamas at the time. Uh, this experience we, we then decided as uh, WICLAC that we want to document. And we really documented this from the experience of women. And now we have a whole uh, documented uh, report which we prepared and launched uh, in only in uh, uh, 2017. It took us 20 years maybe to reflect on it. And the report was out. It started by the previous director, the founder of my organization, WICLAC. But then I uh, pursued the project and I launched the report when I took over in, uh, in 2015. The founder, uh, deceased Maha Abu Dayye, uh, who was my teacher as well because I worked with her. Uh, she was my boss and she worked with me and she 
has a lot to do with uh, where I stand today now in defending women's human rights. Uh, she 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 wanted to document the experience and she finalized that, but she passed away only before the launching of the uh, the study. Mm-hmm. The report is, is a testimony. It's, it's a very important report for next generations of women feminists and women um, feminist movements to understand that political climate that doesn't change in our world, right? It's very static. We see that. We see that happening over and over. Women being manipulated and used for political reasons. And this is something else we want to talk about, how the West perceive us as women, as if we are submissive, as we, they don't know about our internal struggles as well. So that kind of report that, that has this importance, how can you communicate this report to a woman all over the world. Actually, we did the report in both Arabic and English to make sure that we reach out to the wider uh, uh, societies. But uh, yes, as you mentioned, we are not submissive people. We, uh, on the contrary, and now I see it, you know, uh, in the Arab movement as well, in the Arab, uh, in the MENA region, uh, new movements are emerging. And, and they are very strong movements. We had, uh, in the in the past, we had Aisha movement. Uh, now we have Selma. We have now, during COVID-19, uh, Qadirat in, in, in Tunisia, uh, initiated by Tunisian women. We have uh, now, during COVID-19, there was an initiative to have a network that includes most of the women's feminist uh, movement in the MENA region. And we developed a, a strong network. We have a very vibrant civil society, feminist movement, women's organizations, working, responding to needs, to conflicts, to occupation, to all of that. Uh, At the same time, we are still not in decision-making positions in public life. And the discourse used by our governments is still uh, establishing our traditional roles as housewives and mothers and uh, free caregivers to members of the family. And therefore, even in the discourse of the spokesperson of the Palestinian Authority, he came up to say uh, to women, uh, during Ramadan, it's true that you're still on lock, uh, lockdown, but I'm sure the, your wives will provide you with the best meals you could ever think of. I think uh, our problem in the MENA region is that we are witnessing generally a re- a regression mm. in, in rights and freedoms, in democracies. I mean, the mm-hmm. Arab Spring has not has not really materialized into changing the whole situation to a. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the results we we turned out that the the existing regimes were able to re- retain their positions and uh, come in different forms in in decision making positions at the expense of developing democracies and uh, 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 with exceptions, I would say. Definitely. And if you think about it, this is very disappointing, especially for the youth, right? And the the increased number of mental um, issues, the immigration, uh, the youth have um, uh, given up on us. Uh, They're immigrating to the West, uh, thinking, you know, there they would find themselves. They would find their... Exactly. And they are not given the, given, they are not given the opportunity. I would give you one example from the Palestinian context. Uh, Wiklak and uh, the feminist movement in Palestine is move, is pushing for uh, more representation of women in the upcoming Palestinian elections, which will take place in May. Uh, in last week, we were uh, 18th of, uh, of March. There were uh, uh, discussions taking place in, uh, in Cairo among the political parties. Among our de- demands was that we wanted to reduce the age of uh, uh, candidacy to, to, mm. to men and women to, to enable the younger generation to take over the political uh, it's 28 28 years which is uh, not the average even in the region in the region it's around 22 23 anybody from the younger generation cannot uh, run into the upcoming uh, uh, palestinian legislative ele- elections and uh, they cannot reach parliament the political parties meeting in uh, cairo last week 
were like all agreeing and they came up with a code of conduct and agreement on the upcoming elections but there was no consensus on reducing the age of uh, of uh, candidates or uh, the the 30% quota for women which we wanted them to uh, push forward but what we had was that we agreed with the political parties and the national council uh, that that there will be 30% representation quota for women uh, now we want to push for the political parties to ensure that these are in the top priority of the list because they might not win the elections and we don't expect more than 22 to 23% representation of Palestinian women in the upcoming elections all depending on the Palestinian political parties we had to bear the brunt of political divide between the two major political parties Hamas and Fatah and now it seems that there are uh, arrangements between them to 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 forget all the of the conflict of the past without any uh, transitional justice without paying the price of the victimization of numerous families uh, by killing them and arresting them and torturing them and all of that they want to forget all of that they're now reaching out to uh, what they call to divide the seats among them and they might come up even with a joint list uh, at the expense of the rights and freedoms of the people that will not allow the younger generation because those who are in power will stay in power so they're not going to allow the younger generation to take the lead but uh, the, our problems are also the results of the lack of interference and lack of interest of the international community to change the situation in the Middle East. The development is because of their uh, control of our resources, of our uh, political life, our alliances in our region, their interests, their economic, political interests in our region. Um, I uh, 100% agree with you. No one is innocent of what's happening in Palestine. And, and even when we talk about Palestinian women and feminist movements in Palestine and how it has been dropped, from the academic discourse, this is not done innocently. This is, in a way, definitely, it is politicized. It is trying to reinforce and perpetuate a certain image of Palestinian women. What you represent today, you're such a role model for, for feminists, not just in the Arab world, but also in the whole world. People need to see that more often. They, You know, in our universities, the, the percentage of women uh, uh, graduates reaches 65%. Exactly. Palestinian women are educated. You know, uh, my mother is 92 years. She speaks three languages. She has uh, got her uh, degree. And that was, uh, this is this is the real example of Palestinian women. I mean, my mother is not young, but she can speak French, English, and Arabic. And, and that really reflects that, the, especially at the time, Jerusalemites and in the main cities of Nablus and Hebron, and, Women were getting their education and they were engaged. But this is also as uh, correct as about other Arab women in the region. We are uh, progressing. We are uh, confronting many challenges, being in patriarchal societies, being under colonial occupation or being in our situation as Palestinians, but, but, but also in conflict situations where we as women are pay and young girls are paying the price. The, the highest price compared with other members of the society. Uh, women in Yemen, in Libya, in, in, in Iraq, in all the region are still suffering from the, Syria, all the, the conflicts that we have no interest in, the wars that we did not range. You know, it wasn't us that made the wars, but we have to bear the brunt of these wars and Thank conflicts in our region. So without being in I mean, that's what we always say. If we are not in the leadership, we are not in decision-making positions, we are not changing, we are, we, are, we are not able to make change because we know the priorities. We know the needs of all members of the family. We don't want wars. We want to build peace and security, human security to everybody in our own communities and society. I didn't mention the sufferings of Palestinian women under occupation. The Israeli yeah. occupation continues with its... Uh, with its uh, business as usual, as usual. Palestinian women are suffering during COVID-19 and, uh, and before that. Over all the years of my life as a Palestinian woman, I was six years and a half, seven years when the occupation uh, took over Palestine. And uh, we, uh, we, we had to live our lives within a patriarchal society, under colonial occupation, 
and as well as as uh, sufferings that has been compounded with COVID-19 and all the responsibilities in, in Dutch on us as Palestinian women. But having said all of that, we are part of the national movement as early as the 19th uh, century. Uh, uh, we have been engaged. Our role has changed, but we have been all through the, uh, the movement, working closely with the Palestinian national movement, and at the same time linking that with our struggles as women and as feminists. And we are much concerned as Palestinian women uh, to end uh, this situation, which is the grassroots of all our problems, to have a, a just and durable solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Brenda Senora, thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. Thank you for opening some eyes, definitely, to the realities of the Palestinian women uh, and the history of, of uh, feminist movements in, in Palestine. And thank you for amplifying Uh, the other voices uh, within the community. This shows the intersectionality of what we do. Uh, women are a part of all levels of the society and your struggle is our struggle. Thank you so much, Amal, for giving me this opportunity to be on your po podcast. Uh, I hope that my voice reaches out. I'm only one example of many hundreds, thousands of Palestinian women who are braver, who are uh, stronger, who are uh, working in order to change Uh, uh, the realities of women in, and uh, uh, to have a better life for uh, us and for our uh, new gen for the new generation of our uh, children and uh, grandchildren we want a better life where we live in peace and security and, uh, and and at the same time uh, enjoy our rights and freedoms uh, as women and girls in our own communities Definitely, and with people like the, you, we always we are always hopeful. Um, we're with you, heart and soul, qalban wa qaliban. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much. much. Thank you so much. For thank me. you very much for having me. I am honored to be on this uh, program. We have listened to Randa Senora's um, interview. I hope we have understood the complexity of uh, the lives of Palestinian women and moreover the complexity of the work of feminist organizations um, in Palestine. I touched upon scholarship um, on Palestine uh, in the episode. I spoke about a book that was produced by one of our faculty and I'd like to end with a voice note uh, from one of our uh, MA graduates from Women's Society and Development MA program. Her name is Ishraq Uthman and she has uh, written her thesis on uh, Palestine and Palestinian women. And finally, I leave you with a lovely voice from Kuwait, the voice of Hamoud al Khadr, who sings for Palestine. Until next time, take care and stay safe. My thesis title is uh, Representations of Palestinian Naqab Between Women in Israeli Cinema gender and sexuality in settler colonial imaginaries. Um, in my thesis, I focus on two, uh, two Israeli uh, films, uh, which are Sand the Storm uh, and Desert Brides. They both represent the Palestinian Naqab twins uh, from a colonial orientalist perspective with a strong gendered dimensions. Um, this perspective reinforces several stereotypes on Bedouins, labeling them as polygamous, uncivilized, tribal, and nomadic, who reject to be modernized and prefer to stay in isolated desert basins with goats and camels. And both films actually emphasize the patriarchal cultural subjugation of Bedouin women ignoring uh, the colonial situation they live in, uh, such as, for example, the problem of uh, unrecognized uh, villages, the problem of poverty, the problem of being prevented uh, from uh, several civil and social rights in a uh, community. Uh, both movies actually represent the Israeli settler colonizer as a savior who will save brown women from brown men that's uh, also as to save oppressed Bedouin women from their 
uh, oppressive Bedouin men. The films actually do not focus on the Bedouin women's active participation in community. They always depict them as passive, as controlled, uh, subdued, subjugated women, submitted to the male dominant society and confined in their private sphere. However, um, there are so many Palestinian Bedouin women who are agents, who have power, who uh, are very active in uh, community, who hold different uh, uh, posts or uh, jobs. The significance of this study lies in bringing new counter perspectives on colonial orientalist representations of uh, the Palestinian Naqab Bedouins, shedding the light on uh, the crucial role that knowledge production plays in underlining and justifying um, political projects such as uh, the Israeli settler colonialism. This kind of study may urge Palestinian filmmakers to work on presenting um, these counter perspectives in Palestinian cinema and I uh, really believe that uh, future film studies on Israeli cinema, which sheds the light on Palestinian Naqab Bedouin, sh should actually reflect the the actual and factual life of of Bedouin uh, women. <laughs> Let me see you in every time.